midwinter service for the last 24 years. Is this 24? Is this going to be 25? Somewhere there. I think it was just two years after the Lord brought you back to testify. He's been, he's been here every year. And uh, he goes home for the holidays. And then uh, he comes over here for a couple of days to relax from the holiday at home. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> a lot of times in the past, his wife used to come along and we enjoyed having her. And uh, she had a health problem for a while, but the Lord has restored her to a great degree. And uh, we just appreciate that. But it's a privilege for Brother Howard to come and make a report of what he feels and has seen in the past year and what the Lord shows him for what we can expect in the days ahead of us. Brother Howard. Praise the Lord. We bring you greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And it is good always to be able to come back here, uh, share once again what <clears throat> the Lord has placed on our heart, so to speak. <clears throat> uh, those of you that, that don't know me, I'm just an old country preacher. Has been rumored that sometimes I tend to become long-winded, but we pray that that won't happen tonight. But if it does, and you get through before I do and want to leave, just go right ahead. You understand? Me? <clears throat> I like to tell about a little church in Ohio where I went to one time. The preacher said, uh, Brother Pittman, your reputation as being slightly long-winded has preceded you. See that clock back there on the wall? I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, well, don't pay no attention to it. Don't even think it's there. You just go ahead and do whatever you got to do. But when it comes 12 o'clock, my people are going home. <laughs> so if you have to go home, we understand that. You know, preachers sometimes call on to do strange things. I heard them tell about a preacher they wanted to preach the funeral of a dog. And somebody talked about a Protestant chaplain in the army was called on to pray for a Muslim soldier that had died, he wanted him to pray to Allah. So you never can tell what situation a preacher might wind up in. I heard this gospel singer, Green, the other day on the radio say that a friend of his died, a very close friend of his died, and his wife insisted that he come sing at his funeral. And he did, and when he got there, she said, I want you to sing three songs. Amazing Grace, Land for We Never Grow Old, and Jingle Bells. He said, Jingle Bells? That's not a film. I said, she said, my husband wanted those three songs, so please sing. He said, okay. So he sang Amazing Grace, Land for We Never Grow Old, and so he tried to sing Jingle Bells as sad as he could, but he just couldn't get it out. <laughs> And after the funeral, the wife came up to me and said, well, thank you for singing, but I don't know what I was thinking about. Because it wasn't Jingle Bells, it's when they ring the Golden Bell. <laughs> <laughs> but it was too late. Some of us get involved when it's too late, don't we? For it says in, uh, over in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. On the third day of August 1979, a paramedic judged me to be dead in an ambulance 19 miles from the hospital. At that time, a tremendous spiritual experience occurred in my life where my spirit was literally taken from my body, carried into the spirit realm, where I was given a look at Satan's kingdom. I grew up in what we call back home the basic mainstream of the fundamentalist church movement, where we 
talked about love, mercy, grace, and salvation. And that's about all we talked about, too. And that's the bedrock of Christianity. But really, it only covers two-thirds of the Bible. There's another third. You see, our God is a just God, a righteous God, a merciful God, but he's also a just God. We have an enemy. And that's one thing I never learned about in church. I never learned about that enemy. You know, I heard in passing reference to the devil, reference to demons. But I really didn't know what I believed about them. I attended a Baptist Theological Seminary in New Orleans. And we had one professor in particular that talked about these things just being the figment of imagination of the early church writers. And, you know, I didn't know what to believe about. I didn't know if I even really believed they were real or what, because, you know, I, I had never heard a sermon on the devil or ever heard a talk about demons, not in church, not in a seminary. And I was a, a church pastor myself. I had to do research on just about every character in this Bible, except the devil, except demons, except the spiritual realm. So you might say I was probably the sorriest candidate in the world for what God was going to do that day and what he was going to show me. You know, my wife and I had a ministry in our own home, too, where we, take in, we took in abused, misused, neglected, and thrown away children. We were privileged to take into our home 32 children. They ranged in age from 13 months to 18 years. And it was the ministry of the children that first opened my eyes to the, re to the realization that I had missed something very, very important in my education. I didn't know, even when those deep, dark, hidden scars begin to come to the surface in the lives of those little children. And I could see all the hurt and turmoil and tribulation and trouble that these children had undergone. And every one of them in their way was trying, calling out for help to me. And I couldn't help them. I didn't know what was wrong. I knew I'd missed something. It was very important what I missed. <clears throat> they brought one little girl to our house one day. I believe she was about 18 months old. And the state workers that rescued that little girl that day had to break open a cage where she was locked up with a cat. And the only thing they told me she had had in that cage to eat in the last 48 hours was the droppings of that cat. And the demon-possessed individual that had that little girl delighted himself by putting out his lighted cigarettes on her bare feet. Now, that's not human. I don't know what you believe or what you think, but that's not human. I did not know about this dark world, this evil world, this enemy that God was going to bring me face to face with on that day. My education had been sorely lacking. I didn't know what I'd missed, but I knew I had missed something very important. And on that day when the paramedic judged me to be dead, I crossed the veil of darkness so fast that in your wildest imagination you can never imagine what it's like to cross the veil. Time will not permit me to go in and give my entire testimony tonight. I'm just going to touch on part of it. What I saw in the demonic realm. How God really opened my eyes to the reality of that devil. But I think y'all have my testimony book, don't you? It's, it's entitled Placebo, if they have it back there. It tells a whole story if you're interested and you haven't heard it. The very first thing when I crossed that veil, and I, I was enveloped 
with undescribable darkness. There's no words in the human language to describe what enveloped me in this vast darkness. The Bible refers to the veil as the valley of the shadow of death. Many Christians refer to it as crossing Jordan. The veil is not in our world, nor is it in the world to come. It is a place where all humans die, where all physical death takes place. We don't die in this world, and we don't die in the world to come. Life ends at the veil as we cross through the valley of the shadow of death. The very first thing that that came to me in that vast darkness was a verse of scripture. It looked like a, a ticker tape suspended in space, just slowly turning around and around before my eyes. It was that single verse of scripture that I just read. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. We'll read it again. Because it, as it turned before my eyes, now I can't tell you how I saw this, because there's no light in the veil. But I saw it with no light. As though it was a light unto itself. It just revealed itself. It was like a ticker tape as it turned slowly. Three times. Three times I read that verse of scripture. Well, not that one I read. It was uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It is appointed unto all men wants to die after this judgment. That was the verse of scripture that I saw before my very eyes. And I read it three times. Upon reading it the third time, it dawned on me what was happening. This was God's simple way of supernaturally revealing to me that I had met my appointed time to die. Well, like all humans, I knew intellectually that I had to die. We all do. But like all humans, we view death, physical death, so we've already dealt with that in our subconscious. In our subconscious, we view it, death is something that happens to others. It don't happen to us. And we put it out of our mind and keep going. I put it out of my mind so far that I had to read that verse of scripture three times before it dawned on me. It's not others. It's me. It's my time to die. I didn't want to die. I didn't leave home to die. I was involved in a political campaign at that time. I thought I was going to win a race. And I left home expecting to win a race, a political campaign, not to die. I didn't want to die. Instantly, the Holy Spirit began to intercede on my behalf. At first, I never even recognized him. I came very close to him to being torpedoed by my own theology. Theology, theology can be a dangerous thing, you know. Yeah. What he did was <clears throat> he began to flood my mind with the knowledge of King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was a good king of Israel that didn't want to die. He cried out to God when Isaiah come to tell him to put his house in his order and made his time to die, he didn't want to die. And uh, he cried out to God. God heard him and extended his life for 15 years. I didn't realize that was the Holy Spirit flooding my mind with that knowledge. And I didn't realize what it was all about. See, what it was all about, the Holy Spirit was simply showing me that there was a precedent in God's Word for a human being to have his life extended beyond his appointed time to die. I didn't catch it right away. I wasn't too spiritually swift at that moment. So when I didn't move, then he began to reveal to me, just like showing on the screen, all the supernatural acts that God had performed through Jesus when he was here on earth. And when I, I suddenly realized what was happening, I didn't want to die like Hezekiah. I cried out in a very short, I mean, it was very short, just a few words. In a very short, pointed prayer, I simply asked God to extend my physical life as he had done Hezekiah's. Immediately upon that short prayer, I had my first ever supernatural encounter with the God of this world. When out of that darkness, the most beautiful voice that any human ear had ever heard, 
of the Lord that would defy any description. All the words, all the language, all the flowers, all the music, all the beauty in the world could not compare to what I heard. No human ear had ever heard this sound. It was so overwhelming, so totally, absolutely compelling, hypnotic, to the point that my very spirit cried out that God was speaking to me. As the voice said to me, stop. Don't breathe. No more pain. Peace, rest, security, all that you have ever wanted. Just don't breathe. Well, for over 30 years, I had professed to serve God. You can imagine what I was going to do. I was breathing by willpower only. It was going to take willpower to shut it down. I immediately began to muster every ounce of strength I had, trying to comply. But all of a sudden, as though I screamed as loud as I could in my spirit, his realization hit me. No! What am I doing? I just asked God to extend my life. I don't breathe. I'm going to die. You are not God. With that explanation, Satan fled from me. There in the valley of the shadow of death, at the very door, he lied to me. He told me he was God. He couldn't kill me. He had to get me to kill myself. You better know the spirit that speaks to you. When I resisted the devil, he fled from me. The angels were all around me. They'd been there all the time. They never made their presence known until I resisted the devil. Instantly, they took my spirit out of my body, out of darkness in the light. That old ambulance was going down the road. They had Howard Pittman's body, but they didn't have Howard Pittman. The angels in glory had Howard Pittman. And the very first thing I was allowed to look at was this verse of Scripture being acted out like a stage play. It had all the characters. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Dearly beloved, that is a description of a satanic, demonic, spiritual government where the warfare plans are literally being drawn up against the saints of God. Did you know if you're a Christian, you're called to war? Did you know if you're not a Christian, you're a prisoner of war? There's no neutrals in this life. <coughs> Jesus has already said it. You gather with me, or you scatter against me. You're either with him, or you're against him. There are no neutrals in this life. As I watch this council at work, and it's a council made up of many beings, all the princes hold a seat upon this government. What did it say? We wrestle against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world in high, wicked, spiritual places. Plural, principality is a territory. Say this would be a fellowship. It might be declared a single principle principality. If it was a declared principality, a single prince would be placed in charge of it. He would hold a seat on this ruling council. He becomes responsible for every Christian in this principality. That prince, that single prince, is in charge of every one of the Christians in this particular principality. He holds a seat on that ruling council. Now it is incumbent upon him He's held accountable by the chairman of that council, Satan himself. He becomes accountable to the ruler of the council. It is incumbent upon that prince to hold this principality to the barest minimal threat possible. If he can make, negate the threat, great, but just hold it to its minimum, if, where, where it, you know, possible. So that's that prince's job. Now, Satan's not concerned about this principality anymore because he's turned it over to that prince. 
But should an individual in this principality rise above the ability of that prince to deal with it, then it becomes the problem of the chief himself. Until then, the chief knows nothing about what's going on in this principality because he has delegated that authority. Every individual in this principality would have at least one, if not more, evil spirits, we call them demons, assigned to them. Now that spirit's first job, of course, is to search every individual and determine the weaknesses of that individual as far as a plan to negate his power or, or threat to the kingdom of darkness. When they have thoroughly searched all individuals and developed this plan, it might be plan A, B, C, and D, right on down. You're not going to stop with one plan. If you overcome it, there goes the next one. So they're going to try to tarnish your light as much as they can. See, it is your light they worried about. You have been appointed a light unto a lost, dark, dying world. You're an ambassador for Christ. And ambassadors are only taken seriously when they present a serious threat. So, if you are a true soldier, then you're going to have a light. And that light is what they want to put out. And what is your light? It is your credibility as a witness for Jesus Christ. The more credible you are, the brighter your light. The more credible you are. See, it's, it's when the only way you're going to make those people in darkness see Jesus Christ or hear you when you name Jesus Christ is let them see him living in you. They got to see him reflected by you. In other words, they'll never hear you in that world. They will not hear you until you break through that barrier. You've got to. So what they're going to do, they're going to try to hold your threat to the very minimum. And one of the first things they're going to try on you, one of the very first things, because it's so successful, they're going to try to drown you. Not in water, in personal problems. They want to create so much personal problem that you're spending 99% of your time just trying to hold your head above sinking. Keep your house from caving in on you. Keep your marriage from falling apart. Holding your children together. Doing all these things where you ain't got no time to serve God. The more problems they can create for you, the less of a threat you are to them. Turn all your energy inward if they can. Turn it inward. This is one of the first attacks they're going for, and it's very successful. It is very successful. And then, of course, there's three ways demon spirits can attack. Temptation, buffets in the flesh, and through the inherited generational curses. This is how they work, through those three ways. And it's given unto you as a believer to defeat them in all three ways. Demons are only soldiers, spiritual soldiers. They actually have no will, they have a will, but they are subjective to their chief. There are two emotions in the dark world that rule that world. Only two. And both of those emotions are entirely foreign to the human being. And that is hate and fear. Both of which will destroy a human body if you let it fill up with it. Hate and fear. That's the two emotions that actually operates and move in that dark world. They hate humans and they fear their boss. Can you imagine working for eternity under a boss that you fear? Not only you fear, but you hate him also and can't do anything about it. The closest look you're going to get at the orchestrated demonic world is to look at the Hindu system of caste, the caste system. Caste system is 
and this world is based on birth. If you're born as an outcast, you're going to live and die as an outcast. You could marry someone in a higher caste than you, but it wouldn't pull you up, it would pull them down. There's no way to rise above your birth in this life. That's why the people, that, they got to be good enough when they die to come back in the next level. Be good enough when they die to come back in the next level. Be good enough to die when they're trying to get to the top through birth. See, they believe that. But in the demonic world, it's not cast by birth. It's by strength. The strongest ones at the top, the next strongest, the next strongest, the next strongest, the next strongest, until they get to the very bottom. And every order is looking up, wanting to be one high, one cast high, and never able to make it. They are there forever where they are. Demonology is a study of demons and their origin their ability, and their effect on the physical human body. Since the, the beginning of man time, every civilization has known of the existence of <coughs> demon spirits. Satan does not have to hide where there is no threat to him. He hides only where there is no threat. The greatest threat to the kingdom of darkness rests within this nation at the present time. There are some whole nations that they don't have but one principality because there's no threat. One prince might rule over an entire nation because there's no threats in the nation. But where there are many threats, then there are many principalities. They become smaller because he has to have more effort to deal with it to deal with those principalities. But who are these beings that we call demons? Some people teach they're only mythical beings or characters that are even talked about in the Bible, but a lot of people don't consider them threatening. Even people that believe that demons are real and that demons do affect the physical world they're still in much disagreement over the roles that demons actually play. It's not just limited to how to deal with demons, but to the very origin. Where did they come from? Who are they? And why would God create such beings? And for what purpose? There's little agreement, even in the Christian world, where people, people engage in, in deliverance ministry. Many know little about the origin of these spirits. There are three basic theories that run throughout Christianity. I'm going to give you those three theories. Theory number one, many people believe that hold a theory number one that demons are disembodied embodied spirits of an offspring of a super race created by angels cohabitating with female humans. Theory number two, that demons are only fallen angels. Theory number three, demons are the disembodied spirits of a pre-Adamic race of humans that was so polluted that God was forced to destroy the whole human race and recreate it with Adam. Now that's the three theories. And all three theories have some scripture, in fact, to support them. Just like the theories of the rapture. There are four main theories concerning the rapture. Or no rapture. One, one is rapture before the tribulation. The other is a mid period of the tribulation. The third one is, is uh, post at the end of the tribulation period. The fourth one is no rapture at all. Now that's the four main theories of, of the uh, rapture and all four of those theories does in fact have scripture and Bible that will support them. Now we know God is not the author of confusion. So why would he have scripture that would support such a theory it's just like supporting all three of these theories as far as the demonic world is concerned. We know God is not the author of confusion. But 
there are some things that we're not intended to know at the at time. There comes a place in time when all of the secrets will be revealed to us. Amen. There is a cadre or a core of angels called the heralding angels. The heralding angels are those angels that reveal God's secret at time at when it's time for it to be revealed. Amen. John encountered them in the book of Revelation when they took him on a tour of time, so to speak. So those angels at, at that time will destroy. But as far as the rapture, there, <coughs> there's a new theory that has arrived on the scene. It's theory number five. We call it the pan theory. If you're ready, it's going to pan out. It don't matter. You know. <laughs> <coughs> That's the one I belong to, the pan theory. It's going to pan out. <coughs> now, we, let's look at theory number one as far as the, the origin of demon spirits. Theory number one is enforced by Scripture, Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 5. And I'm going to quote it. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they choose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, but that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. Also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the weakness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now that is the basis of the scripture for theory number one, that these were the offsprings of that race, ungodly race of giants <clears throat> that was born as a result of Spirits cohabitating with human beings. Theory number two is supported by such scriptures, Revelation 12, 4, which says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to heaven, did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Theory number three, <clears throat> the pre-Adamic race or creation seems to be supported by such scriptures as Genesis 1-3, Genesis 1-16, and Genesis 1-28. When Genesis 1-16 is compared to Genesis 1-3, it looks as though God created two different lives at two different times. But a close examination of Genesis 1-28 basically is the main uh, uh, verse for which this theory is based on, shows that when God created Adam, he told him, to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. That word replenish in Hebrew literally meant reproduce or recreate or bring into being another race of humans to replace those who have been destroyed. And basically that's the, the, the basis of the scripture from which these three theories were born in the theological circle of today. Now, I spent a great deal of time on the subject of demons. I knew very little about it until God opened my eyes and let me see the demonic world at work. And it was watching that council at work that I literally discovered how spiritual warfare is fought. It is an orchestrated war. It is well thought out and planned and carried out. And the events that are occurring around the world right now were orchestrated before that council. They were passed there before that council, and we read the headlines in the paper to see these events that are occurring and the things that are happening. Now, there's a whole lot that the naked eye does not see what's going on in our world that literally came from the spiritual world. And we don't understand the meaning of all of it. For instance, we don't understand just how 
powerful the bloodline is that flows today through the presidents of the United States and all the kings of Europe. What we do know now from the bloodline of Burke's peerage that was released before this last election that all the presidents, ever presidents that served in the United States literally came from the bloodline of, and every king in Europe, the presidents of the king came from the bloodline of two sisters, Mary and Martha Warners, and they were all kin by blood. We don't understand, we can't know the secrets of why these things occur, but they're very important to what's happening in the spiritual world. We, we, we can't understand some of the things that, for instance, the oceanographers have told us that they have discovered giant rivers in the bottom of the ocean. That these rivers flow with fresh water in the bottom of the ocean. How is that possible? We don't know. How is all of this possible or why? We know Luke tells us <coughs> that the devil in the fourth chapter of Luke, verse 5, bragged that he installed government that it was his prerogative as the God of this world. He could appoint who he wanted to. He tried to tempt Jesus with that very thing. But we don't understand all of these things. <clears throat> but God has given us enough knowledge to know how to deal with our current situation. Now let's look <clears throat> at these three, three theories just a minute. I believe all three of them have some basis of truth and they have some wrong parts about them. <clears throat> Most of the people who hold the theory number one say that theory two cannot be true because such scriptures, Jude 6, plainly shows that those angels who rebelled have been placed in chains or in prison. So they say it can't be fallen angels because they've been locked up. Well, let's see if that's what the Bible really said. See, we have a, we have a problem sometimes comprehending what even what we read. So let's go back and read it a second time and look closely. Let's see. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now that <coughs> June 6, what we read. Now, which angels did he lock up in chains? Which ones? The ones that did two things. Look carefully what he said. It was the ones that did what? Which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. What was their first estate? What is your first estate? Physical. What was the angel's first estate? Spiritual. Spiritual. What was their habitation? heaven. They were spirits in heaven. They had to leave their first estate in order to cohabitate with human beings. They had to have a physical body. Spirits are sexless. Therefore, spirits cannot cohabitate. They have to have physical bodies. So, they left their first estate and their place of habitation. Not all of them did. But there was a group that did. All right. <clears throat> so one third of the angels did rebel. The Bible is very clear. And there are people who teach that this rebellion is yet to take place. That the war in heaven has not been fought. If you read the scripture, it clearly says the woman was getting ready to give birth to the child when the rebellion took place. That was before the nation of Israel was even created. So it had to have been in the past. And when we look in its original form, in the uh, receptors, Texas receptors, it was in the past tense. So we know that not all of those angels left their first estate. First estate being spiritual. But it clearly shows here 
He said, and the angels which kept not their first estate, indicating that only a part of them did not keep their first estate. They were the ones. Now there was a, there's a purpose in everything that Satan does. He does nothing by accident, nothing haphazard. It's all planned and it's all designed. He had a purpose for this group of angels to leave their first estate. Now angels can do that. Angels can take on themselves human form. But they're only allowed to do this while on specific assignment. Satan himself could have taken on a human form. But there was only two human bodies on earth when he came. Spirits cannot have concise communication with flesh without a physical body. Therefore, Satan had to get whatever body that was most graceful to him at that time, and he used the body of a snake. It was a physical body. There was only two bodies, Adam and Eve, and his job was to tempt them, <clears throat> to get them to fall, and he had to have a body to talk to them in. So he took the body of a snake. He could not talk to them in the spirit. The spirits cannot have concise communication with human beings in the spirit form. This is why guardian angels appear amongst humans in physical form. They can communicate, they do communicate, and they come in human form. We told this in Hebrew chapter 13, verse 2, that when we entertain strangers, be careful, for many times we entertain angels unaware. Unaware because they appear as normal human beings. And if they're going to be normal human beings, they're not going to appear as an angel. They're going to appear as a human because they're, they're, <clears throat> they're covert agents, so to speak. They are not to be revealed or respected as angels. I think, I'm not sure of this, but I think I've had two encounters with angels in human form since I've been back here. And both encounters were specifically designed. One of them took place very early <clears throat> after my experience. When the Lord sent me back and allowed me to go, the very first place that opened their door to me, see, he placed two restrictions on me. Number one was, I could not ask anybody to hear this, but I must go tell where I was at. I had no choice. When somebody asked me to go, I was supposed to take down their invitation and get to it when I could without question, no matter where it was. And he sent me around the world three times doing that. So the first people that called me up, the very first people that called I wasn't even out of bed when they called me up. And that was Pat Robertson at 700 Club. The very place, the very first place God sent me. And on that day, Pat told me that that's when he used to own the station. When he used to have it in so many countries. You know, they've sold all that now. It belongs to ABC. They only reserved an hour a day or so on the place, but they don't own uh, that network anymore. They sold it to ABC. But back when they owned it and they had spread all over its heyday, it was spread all over the country in the 80s. I think this was in 1980. That was in 1980 when Pat called me there. And when he told me that day, he said 60 million people, we're gonna see what you say the other day. 60 million people around the world one time. Now that's a whopping big audience, isn't it? Well, from that day to this, the invitations have not stopped coming in around the world. Three times I've been around the globe. But I just lost my train of thought. What was I thinking of? It's just that quick. You know? <coughs> that was real, man. Angel. But I'll get it back. <clears throat> the angels, yes. The angels that I had a confrontation with. Thank you. Right after, right after that show, I had people calling my house all from all over the they wanted a, a tape or a video or a book about that. <coughs> I didn't have a tape. I didn't have no video. I didn't have no book or nothing. I just went and came with that one. So my wife said to us, why don't you just write it down? See, <coughs> I'm not an author. I've got 15 books out now. But I'm not an author. I'm a scribe. See, an author makes it up. A scribe just writes it down. So I said, okay, I'll write it down. <clears throat> so I'll just write it down. And that day, 1980, I had an old Underwood typewriter. 
on Texas. Didn't have no computer. Onion skin with all those carbons in it, and you're typing away on that thing. You make one mistake, zip, start over, you know? Zip, start over. More in the garbage than it was on the desk, you know? I'm sitting there writing, throwing away paper, writing, because I wasn't a good typist to begin with. My wife was a good typist. She was a secretary one time. She was a good typist, but she had so much to do, she could help me very little. So I told her <clears throat> one day, I said, I'm going to quit. I can't do this. I had it down longhand. I wrote it longhand, and that's when I'm trying to transfer it over. Can't do it. I said, I'm going to quit. <clears throat> Next morning, knock on my door. And I go open the door, and this young man said, and they said, you are Howard Tillman? I said, yeah. So I came to type your book for you. I said, well, praise the Lord, come in. <laughs> so he came in, and he says, uh, where's your office? We were living in Parsonage, a little church, and I mean, a little too. Oh, just a little bit bigger than the bathroom, not much more than that. <laughs> I said, it's out in the church. So we go out in the church building, and old typewriter was sitting there, and he said, I'll type out here. So he goes to work on it. Now, I've been a policeman for 26 years. Policemen are supposed to be curious about everything. Never dawned on me. <laughs> Who was this man? How did he know I was writing a book? Where did he come from? I never asked him any of those questions. I just thought, I was so excited that somebody come to type my book for me. <laughs> come in, come in. And he did. He came in. <clears throat> I had it all down on the phone, man. At noontime, I went over there to see how I was making out. I had, all, had a great bunch of it already. I said, hey, uh, how about let's go have some lunch and don't fast it. Okay, okay, it's fasting, you know, that's it. Mm -hmm. had a Coke machine sitting over there in the church. That night, I go back for dinner and I asked him, I said, how about dinner? He said, no, fast it, don't want anything. He said, okay. How about some water? No, don't want anything. I said, well, quit, come on, we got an extra bed over there. I said, no, we'll stay right here in the office. Okay. So he stayed there in the office. <clears throat> next day, he was through the next evening. Didn't he wouldn't take nothing to eat from him. I said, well, wait. I said, hey, where, where, where did you come from? He said, California. Mm -hmm. I said, where are you going? He said, California. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'll take you down to the bus station and buy you a ticket. No, nope, can't take nothing from you. Mm -hmm. And he left, just like he got. Ain't told me no name. Ain't told me how he knew I was writing the book. Nothing about it. And you know we lost that manuscript after that book was published? It's been published seven times since. And that's the only manuscript that never had a single mistake in it. All the rest of them you read it, so you find a mistake. But it wasn't money in that. And we don't even know what happened to that manuscript after they published. Oh well, <clears throat> that was one case that I've often thought. Maybe maybe that was and you know, <clears throat> not long ago, we had a president of the United States was armed the threat of being impeached. I believe his name was Bill Clinton. They were getting ready to impeach him. And just the door before, day or two before all that came up, the telephone rang. I happened to be home. This boy said, hello. I said, hello. He said, you know who this is? I don't even know the man's name. I said, yeah, you're the man that wrote my book. Just like that. I don't know where that came from, but it did. It came right out of my mouth. He said, I just want to call and tell you, he said, something's about to occur in Washington, D.C. is just as earth-shaking earth in the spiritual realm as the writing on the wall in the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. That's all he said. He said, if it don't happen, You'll never hear from me again if it happens. I ain't never heard from him again. I don't know what he was talking about, but it was the same man. I don't know how to do it either. I think, you know, if, if there is such thing as really speaking to angels, maybe I did, but I think. And one other time, one other time, we'd been up in Tennessee, my wife and I, and we had two of the foster children with us, two boys with us at that time. And we had morning service, 9 o'clock service in, in um, uh, Tennessee that morning. 
and we had a 12 o'clock service way down in Georgia. So as soon as we got out of that 9 o'clock service, we headed to Georgia, got down to Georgia for the 12 o'clock service. And we also had a 7 p.m. service at the same place in Georgia. We got down and had 12 o'clock service, had 7 o'clock service, and then we had to be back in Alabama for the next day. We had to eat no breakfast, no lunch, no dinner. All day, me, my well, wife, and those two boys. And we got to a town called Columbus, Georgia at midnight. And I'm looking for something I hope where we can get a hamburger or something. And I see this sign that says, Big Boy Restaurant. We pulled the motor home, and there were not many people there at midnight, but it's still open. Big motor is open. Many, not many people, not many automobiles there. So we could park close to the door. And we'd, uh, we'd already changed clothes. We was in our motor home. We changed clothes. I put on a, a jumpsuit, and I had a baseball like cap that says, Jesus is Lord, on the front of the cap. And I said, okay, the boys and the wife had put on their pajamas. I said, I'll go in and get some hamburgers, and we'll eat in the motor home. And I go in, and there's a line that says, take out all this here. There were two or three people in that line, so I got in that line. And I'm standing there waiting my time to order, and somebody taps me on the shoulder, and I turn around. Living a short man with flowing white hair standing there. He's wiping his hands with a paper towel. His clothes was disheveled, but they wasn't dirty. Just like you took them out of the dryer and never earned them. And I do on, and he says to me, he says, What's that you got right on your cap up there? And I said, Jesus is Lord. And he said, eh? I, I said, Jesus is Lord. He said, why did you put that there? Why are you right? Who, what do you mean Jesus is Lord? And every time I'd answer him, he'd put his hand behind his head and say, repeat, I can't hear. Him. So he pulled a testimony out of me, standing right there in that line. And everybody in that restaurant quit they just sit there and looked at me, you know? And I'm feeling littler and littler and littler because everybody's looking at me. And the old man just keeps asking me, keeps making me answer him. And keep, every time I answer him, he say, I can't hear you. Repeat that. <laughs> so he pulled a testimony out. About that time, it come my time to get my food and everything. And I turned around, paid the lady, and got my food, got the order, and got started to walk out the door. And I looked for him, and he wasn't there. And I come back and I said to the lady, did you see which way that man went? She said, what man? I said, the man that was talking to me. He said, no, I'm busy. I didn't see anybody. Huh. He must have went out in the parking lot. I go look for him. I want to finish this conversation. And I walk out the door with my food in my hand and I walk around that parking lot and I'm looking. My wife's sitting in the motor home looking at me. So she called, what are you doing? I said, I'm looking for that little man that come out of here before me. She said, ain't nobody been out of that restaurant since you went in there. So I got in the motor home and gave them all that sandwich. I cranked up and started down the road. I'm mumbling to myself. <laughs> she said, what are you talking about? I said, I wonder if I was the only one that saw that man. No wonder everybody was looking at me. <laughs> 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 to this day, I don't know. <laughs> No wonder they thought I was crazy. If they didn't see it, I did. I don't know. It was strange. Well, <clears throat> angels, the guardian angels, do have the ability to take on human form and come amongst us. The Bible tells us that. They do. Well, demon spirits are, they can take on human form, but they're not permitted to do so. Those who did were locked up in chains. So those are the only prisoners that are reserved until the end. That very group there. Now we know it's clear from Revelation 12, 4 that one third of the angels of heaven did revolt with Satan and were cast out of heaven onto the earth. Revelation 12, 7. Were all the rebelling angels taken place, or taken prisoner, put in chains? No, because the scripture clearly tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, that Satan and his angels are still here on earth. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, in the air, all about us. So we know they're not in chains. Because if all of them would have been taken prisoner, Satan would have been placed in chains with them. So he was not. So we know 
then that only those that left their first estate and their place of habitation for the one was taken chain. And we, again, we come back to the clear knowledge that spirit, as such, is sexless. And as such, as spirits could not co cohabitate with human female flesh. In order for cohabitation with human female flesh to take place, the angels had to leave their first estate or spirit existence and take upon themselves a physical human form in order to do it. And it is possible that angels can do this only under permission. And that is why the guardian angels are the group that continually come amongst us in human form. They're not the ministering spirits that, that minister to us from God. It is your, it is your, it is a, a different angel that actually ministers rather than the, the guardian. Of course, the guardian angel is a messenger. He does in many respects minister. We see him in the 18th chapter of Genesis uh, when they came um, and uh, Abraham uh, wanted to know where they were going. And uh, of course, when they got over to Sodom, uh, Lot thought they were human beings. He didn't recognize them as angels because they looked like human beings. Now, why, why, why were they going to Sodom in the first place? You remember what they said? They were going to see if the conditions was as bad as had been reported. You mean they didn't know? They were going to see? See, see this tells us that there's only one spirit that's all-knowing. Only one. God. Omnipresent and all-knowing. Satan, demons, angels cannot be in two places at once. They can only be in one place at one time. Satan had to find a way to make himself omnipresent in order to mount a credible rebellion against God. How did he do that? Through the formation of a government and the delegation of authority. He delegated his authority to the princes, who in turn delegate their authority to the demon spirit. The principality or the prince that might rule over this one principality might have a thousand individual demon spirits serving him in this principality to be sure that they know everything they can about every individual in here. Now, you see, salvation is a personal thing. You are an individual being Jesus died for you. Yes. He did not die for the corporate corporation, for the corporate body. He did not die for the church. He died for you. Salvation is individual. He is a personal Savior, a personal Lord. Therefore, in order to deal with you, Satan must become a personal devil to you. And he does this through the presence of his demon spirits through his demon spirit. No two humans are alike. No two humans present the same kind of threat. This is why he has to know everybody, everything about every individual human. And this is why every individual human is searched thoroughly, minutely. His weaknesses cataloged minutely and his tempters assigned expertly. Expertly. And this is an ongoing, continual warfare every day. As a born-again believer, daily you will become a victim or a victor, depending on the choices you make as a born-again believer. You have to believe that there is power in the Word of God and the power in the blood of Jesus Christ. All right, we know that some of them so polluted the human race, and that was the purpose of the cohabitating with females, was to bring about an ungodly race. The purpose was counteract Genesis 3.15, God's divine decree which God laid down himself in the Garden of Eden when he said that the seed of Eve would win the war. 
Therefore, this was Satan's plan was to destroy or make it impossible for the seed of Eve to carry out that threat. So his attempt to pollute the race was so successful that God was able to save only six human beings. Uh, excuse me, eight human beings. Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their wives. He come within eight souls of winning the battle. But God knew that it wasn't going to be eight. It was all going to come down to one. We know uh, this race of people was so polluted in Genesis 6 that God had to destroy them. He had to destroy them. And we know from such scriptures as Genesis 19, 1 through 3, Ezekiel 11, verse 3, Daniel 8, 15, Zechariah 2, 1, and Luke 1, 11, Revelation 10 and 1, and many other such passages that angels do in fact have the ability to take upon themselves a human body or form. If all the angels who rebelled were taken prisoner, the first one taken would have been Satan himself, the leader of the revolt. No, it was not all who rebelled, but only those who left their first estate along with leaving their place of habitation or heaven. Now, a look at Jude 7 shows what sin those certain angels were placed in chain for. Let's read Jude 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of an eternal fire. The key to this verse of scripture is in the phrase, in like manner. In like manner of whom? Read both Jude 6 and 7 together and then answer is obvious. Those angels who left their first estate and habitation, those angels who were taken and placed in chain were guilty of sexual and perversion sins. In order to commit such sins, the angels had to first take upon themselves the form of humanity or human body. Now, <clears throat> let's take a look at what the scripture has to say in Genesis 6. The first thing we notice in Genesis 6, 2 is the term sons of God. Now, let's look at that. Now, some will say that this passage of Scripture is referring to human beings from the line of Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve. Not so. Not so. This very passage of Scripture is rendered angels in the Septuagint. It is rendered sons of God here. Throughout the entire Bible, throughout this entire Bible, sons of God is given only to those who were created by a divine specific act of God. Think of this now, a divine specific act of God. Only those that were created by a divine specific act of God are called sons of God in this Bible. Okay, who are they? Who are they? The Bible said that which is born of spirit is spirit, John 3, 6, and that which is born of flesh is flesh, okay? The term Son of God is used in the Bible to refer only to those who were created by a divine specific act of God. Here they are. Angels, both good and bad. Jesus Christ. Adam. Those were the own individuals in the Old Testament created by a divine specific act of God. Now, in the New Testament, all of those that were born by the death of Jesus Christ because you, your salvation was personal. At the moment you, Jesus, saved you, that was a divine specific act of God, making you a son of God as a result of that. So this could not have referred to the line of Seth. Impossible. Impossible. Okay. <clears throat> Psalms of God is used in Job, chapter 1, verse 6, 
chapter 2, verse 1, chapter 38, verse 7, Psalms 29, 1, Psalms 89, 6, and Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, and his rendered angels. Angels. <clears throat> the word <clears throat> Napoleon, which is rendered giants in Genesis 6, 4, in Hebrew, literally means falling one. Falling one. Therefore, it's death by their own word. They were the fallen, the, the Nephilim or giants who were the offspring of the union between the fallen angel and the daughters of men. They were evidently great in size and wickedness. But what we find about they were superhuman beings and they succeeded in polluting, polluting the human race until God had no choice, was only able to save eight souls, so to speak. Now, we know about other scriptures in the Bible and about other acts that the ability for angels to take on that human form is done specifically by divine permission only. Now, the term of Son of God is given only to those who were created by divine specific acts of God. It would indeed be impossible for Genesis 6-2 to be referring to anything other than angels. Since a literal acceptance of Genesis 6 2 would mean angels, the only determination left would be which angel. The Bible in Jude 6 and 7 clearly answers that for us. So they were the ones that left their first estate and their place of habitation. And they were uh, they were placed in chains for their sin. Now why did Satan permit certain angels to go beyond the boundaries set by the word of God? Well, let's look at Satan's nature. He was doing two important things when he did this. First, he was testing the waters, so to speak. By testing the waters, I mean he was trying the word of God. He always does that. What did he say to Eve when God just told him you'll die? He said, you won't die. Come right behind and said, you won't die. He's testing the word of God. He does that continually. But his goal was to destroy the line of Eve because Genesis 3, 15 made it clear that God intended to use the line of Eve to win this war. And if Satan could pollute the human race to such an extent that it would be impossible for them to carry out this dictate, he could win the battle. And he wanted to be God, you know, and uh, he tried to exalt himself uh, above uh, even God's own throne. Now we know he, he has never accepted the word of God. We also notice that Satan's attack on Jesus or his temptation of Jesus was so designed to attack the word of God. What did Satan use to attack Jesus with? The very word that Jesus was, Jesus was using to defend himself. So uh, we know the word of God became the sword with which the two fought on the mountain there in the wilderness. So uh, it is only when Satan is confronted head to head with the sword of the spirit of the word of God that he, that is only the way he'll back off. Only then will he back off. Now let's look uh, theory number three concerning the pre-Adamic race or pre-Adamic creation. Was a such thing as a race before Adam on earth? Do we have any clue that such a thing existed? There is evidence that a, a race or a creation did exist before Adam, but it was not human. We believe from the indication in Scripture that there was spirits on this earth before Adam was ever created. Now, <clears throat> there's nowhere in scripture that says it gives us any indication that any human was before Adam. But there is a reference that spirit was on earth before Adam was created. And we find that in Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 13 where Satan himself occupied, or his throne was in the Garden of Eden, and Eden being God's own garden. 
I think it is indeed, indeed a very clear picture from Scripture, as Isaiah 14, 12, that Lucifer himself was the first, or at least one of the first to be created by God. He was given the title Son of the Morning, which was given to Lucifer by God. Now this tells us that the implication in Isaiah 14, 12, when God called Lucifer the Son of the Morning, was that Lucifer was the star, or the first one created on the morning of creation, or as referred to in Hebrew literature as the day star. Now liberal exception, acceptance of these scriptures show us there truly was a pre-Adamic creation here for the planet Earth. But that creation was spirit and not flesh. The first flesh created in scripture by scripture itself was that of Adam. When all the scripture relating to this subject have been reviewed and taken literally, there can only add up to one truth. By accepting these scriptures literally, and this is the truth we come up with, demons are evil spirits made up from one third of the angels that fell when they was, the rebellion took place that was reported in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. Number two, part of those revolting angels were used by Satan to test the boundaries set by God concerning his word, thus becoming the first and only angels ever to be placed in chains. I had a 12-year-old boy write me a letter one time. He wanted to know <clears throat> how can you put chains on the spirit? <laughs> and his, his daddy wrote me another letter right behind and says, why would you take such things as there's demons locked up in chains when you know you can't chain a, a spirit? I said, I wrote back and told him, I said, well, I've given the scripture. I said, I'm only quoting the Bible. Do you believe the Bible? Now, I don't know what kind of change he was talking about, but uh, the Hebrew uh, Greek word in New Testament literally re refers to restraint. They are restrained, so I accept the word chain that they use there. So uh, we, we'll, we'll, because the translators of the King James Bible was far more learned than me. And if they wanted to translate it to say change, that's all right to me. And I, I believe the Bible said it, I believe it, that says it. So <laughs> that's the way it goes as far as I'm concerned. The scripture in Genesis 6-2 is talking about angels who did in fact cohabitate with human flesh in an attempt to so pollute the human race that God's divine degree of Genesis 3.15 would be unable to be fulfilled. This attempt failed, and God was able to save eight souls who had escaped the pollution. He used them to continue the human race. He used the same identical word to Noah that he did to Adam. The same identical Hebrew word when he told him to replenish the earth. That was the same word he had used when he told Adam to replenish the earth. So we see, <clears throat> I believe, from all scriptures that there was a pre-Adamic creation, but it was spirit, not flesh. And that creation, uh, uh, I think, is fully supported in scripture. And I believe, if I accept these scriptures, it's in their literal meaning that um, demons are only fallen angels and still possess the same ability that the angels possess that they were created messengers by God. What made them fall? <clears throat> Why would they rebel against God? When they knew there was no plan of redemption, they knew they could not be redeemed. They desired to look into the plan that got us. The only plan of redemption God ever made was for the seed of Eve, because ultimately it was the seed of Eve in the form of Jesus that defeated Satan there in the wilderness. God therefore made a plan to redeem us. 
But he made no plan to redeem the angels. Right. And they knew this. Yet, knowing this, one third of them rebelled. They lined up with Lucifer in his great battle to overcome all the boundaries that God had established. There are <clears throat> three conspiracies listed in Scripture. The first conspiracy is in Revelation, I'm um, excuse me, is in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, where Satan himself, who was Lucifer, the morning star, uh, not, uh, the, not the morning star, but the day star, Lucifer the day star, conspired with his heart to overthrow the throne of God. He already had a throne. His throne was in Eden, Garden of Eden. And he conspired to overthrow the throne of God. He failed to do that. So the second conspiracy is recorded in Revelation chapter 12 verse 4 where one third of the angels of heaven joined him. And <clears throat> he is not through with his plan yet. Two phases of it has failed. There's one more phase and that is he wants, knowing that he can never be God of heaven. He's been defeated there and he knows that. He's accepted that defeat. To that extent only. He knows he can never rule. That he cannot make the seed of Eve bow before him and call him God in heaven because Jesus has won that war. Jesus holds all the keys. Jesus will rule. It is there Jesus who will be God, not Lucifer, not Satan. Satan, therefore, has one thing left. He so hates the seed of Eve that he wants to take, he knows his sentence has already been passed. It has not yet been carried out. It has been passed. He knows where he's going. He wants to take as many of the seed of Eve with him as he can. Therefore, there is one more conspiracy that has to take place. In order to capture this world, that's his goal now. His goal is to capture this world. Install himself as God to rule here on earth. And make all those who refuse to refuse to bow to him, make them suffer the consequences of the loss of their head, so to speak. In order to do that, he has to get the leaders of the world in league with him. And we're told here in Psalms chapter 2, beginning at verse 100, the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his morning, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. The last great conspiracy is going to involve the rulers of the world government who will be in league with Satan. And they're in league against God and his anointed. Now, how can this be possible? First, the God, they don't know that they're in league with the devil. They've been so deceived. Isaiah said they think, um, they really think that good is bad and bad is good. Therefore, they're looking for a, to create a utopia here on earth. This is their goal. To bring a world filled with peace and prosperity. The only way they can do that is to destroy totally, completely tear down national loyalties. In other words, we've got to make one world instead of a unified bunch of nations. It, it wants to be one world, one world government. In order to do that, they're going to have to slowly but truly do away with the loyalties of uh, people to their nation. And uh, patriotism, that's one of the goals they want to destroy and so on and so forth. And number two, they know everybody is inherently a religious creature, so they want to create a universal God. A universal God that every religion can worship. And many of the religions are, are, are comfortable with a universal God. But you turned out to be the flying ointment. You won't have the blood. And that they cannot abide. See? They cannot abide by that. So that means in order for these world leaders to come together and break about that one world government and install this being as God, 
They're going to have to deal with you. They got two choices. Just two. When they deal with you. First choice is convert you to their way of thinking. If that fails, the only other choice is kill you. Get rid of you. Get rid of you. Because they cannot let you stand in the way of this one world government that they want to bring about. While standing before that council in the spirit, God allowed me to see the outline of that master plan, plan to capture this world. John saw it. He reported it on, in the book of Revelation. In uh, Revelation chapter uh, 13, verse 7 through 9, here's what John reported. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. What is your hope? That your name is written in that book. The only hope you got today in this world. Because this is the generation that's going to see this come to fruition. You have only one chance, and that chance is your name written in that book. And it's something you cannot believe. You must know. You must know it is there. You must have had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. You must know him as a personal Savior. To know of him won't do it. That won't do it. You must know him as a personal Savior. He must be your Lord. See, I called him Lord. I called him Lord every day of my 30-something years that I was out there thinking that I was serving him. He said, you call me Lord, but you did not make me Lord. That's right. What a difference between calling the Lord and making him Lord. To call him Lord gives him a title. To make him Lord promotes him to ruler of life. To ruler of life. The day of playing in the church is long past. If ever you're going to be real, it's now. It's now. Right now is the time. You need to be real more than any other time in your life. It's to know you have had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. That he died for you, just for you. That he gave his life on that cross to save you. And when he did, he wrote your name in that book. Do you know it's there? If you do, if you know it's there, take care. Satan also knows it's there. <laughs> if you know it's there, he knows it's there. Take care. Don't let him put so many evil thoughts in your heart and in your head that such a thing as personal apostasy might appear in your life. Be careful. Be careful. Be very valuable with your name in that book to the kingdom of God. And you are a one target to the enemy. I need not tell you that because you came here because you have been a target of that enemy. You're well aware of the wiles of the devil. But I want to tell you now for a fact that greater is he that lives in us than he that lives in the world. If he lives in us, he will not live with devils. Is that temple holy? Is it his place of residence? This is war. My friends, you cannot employ that armor that will save you, listed in Ephesians chapter 6. The whole armor of God is all you need to win this battle. That's all. Amen. That armor, piece by piece, seven separate pieces listed there. Ephesians chapter 6, 
verse 13, beginning with the whole armor of God. It lists those seven pieces one by one. Notice, among those is the helmet of salvation. Your name must be in that book. Is it there? Do you know it's there? He said, Matthew chapter 10, verse 11 and 12, Whosoever will confess me before men, him will I confess before my father. But whosoever, whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny before my father. Will you stand with me just a moment? If you've never publicly confessed him, you want to do that? Or if you have, you want to confess it again? Just by raising your hand right where you are. Thank you, Father. Lord, we come to you tonight unashamed of you. Willingly do we raise our hand publicly to confess you before me. Some of us may be the first time we've ever confessed you publicly. Some of us we may confess you every day of our life publicly. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity. Every time you present that opportunity to us to confess you before man. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for having our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Father, there's many that come here tonight under the sound of my voice who are hurt by this enemy. Who have been buffeted in their flesh by this very enemy. Who have been tempted in their daily life by this enemy. Some has even inherited those cursed that came through that bloodline. Those generational curses, Father. Right now we speak for every one of those foul and evil spirits. We know they're defeated because you said if we ask believing, we would receive standing, not doubting in our heart, believing your word. It is the sword that sets free all the captives, Father. And we declare these captives free here tonight. Not only are these spirits, who are under the sound of my voice, these evil spirits in this room tonight, not only are they defeated, folks, but you are. So you also are defeated, God. And your end will come in time. We know when that last grand grain of sand falls, that will be your end. The sentence has already been passed, and it will be executed at that day. Your minions now, you can call them home. For these are victorious soldiers under the sound of my voice tonight. Free by the blood of the Lamb set free this night. Thank you, Father, for the great blessings. Thank you for every person in this room. Thank you for everyone who's lifted their hands to heaven to acknowledge you publicly. Thank you most of all for Brother Glenn. Those work so hard that make this world open to everybody that will come from all over the world. Lord bless them. Pour on them abundantly the great blessing. That every family, even members who are not here but families of these that are here, let them receive the blessing tonight through these, Lord, that are here tonight. So abundant blessings might overflow in your precious name, Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.